this week of Doc and Marty McFly from Back to the Future. Maybe you saw this. Looking at the DeLorean and Doc is saying to Marty McFly, whatever you do, do not go to 2020. And I shared that with somebody and they said, or 2019, or 2018, or 2017, or 2016. Um, Honestly, though, over the course of the last eight weeks, it feels like, um, it feels like the world has grown heavier. Um, Maybe it has, maybe it hasn't. That's just how it feels, as if that were possible. I don't know if you've noticed, but I haven't actually given like a Debar Torah for the past like two months here. You know, people were leaving, Anna, Rabbi Lauren, Rabbi Jeff, people were coming, Rabbi Dina, we had guests. I somehow avoided speaking over the past two months in this slot. I mean, like, I, obviously I've been talking about things, but um, I sort of was hoping that by the time I got back in the saddle, things would be looking up and I could just like ride a wave of optimism. No such luck. We're in the midst of a profound test of endurance and it's testing our ability to weather uncertainty and loss and disappointment. And it's extending into so many realms of life, personal, you know, like, I mean, yes, there is geopolitical and there is local and there's also personal, you know, Um, I think like many people are, are feeling like, do I have permission to feel my own feelings about the things just going on in my own little life? And and the answer is, of course, yes. And and all of that is real. And, and we're holding it amidst all of the other feelings that we're, we're all holding. And very few people are coming out of this time feeling like, you know, winners. I mean, some tech companies, I guess. Um, many people are struggling day to day to day to day to find gratitude and joy and to keep the fire burning and to stay hopeful and to stay inspired. And so it feels sort of appropriate, actually, weirdly, that we just entered a period on the Jewish calendar called the three weeks, which is the darkest and most depressing time of the Jewish calendar. Um, This isn't a period of time that gets a lot of press and airtime in most synagogues during the school year because, of course, it's over the summer. Also, it's depressing you know um it's not like uh they came for us uh we survived let's eat it's actually exactly the opposite it's like they came for us they got us let's fast um and so shiva asar Tammuz, the 17th day of the hebrew month of tammuz is a fast day and um and i'll tell you i'll tell you about it in a second it begins a three-week period um, of time between now and Tisha B'Av, which maybe you have heard of. It's sort of like a bigger ticket Jewish holiday. Also depressing, sad, mourning, fasting. Um, so there's a three-week period we're in. And for as long as I have been aware of the three weeks, this period on the calendar in which we sit now, um, I've, I've thought that its purpose was to like help us access sadness, help us access grief, help us access loss and trauma, you know, put us in touch with the liturgy, the Jewish liturgy of loss and trauma. But this year, we don't need help getting there. This week, this year, we are already sitting in a profound place of uncertainty and disappointment and grief and loss. And strangely, I'm finding that the message of the three weeks has changed for me into one that is surprisingly optimistic and an affirmation of radical, brave imagination as the way through these times. I want to talk about how we make it through these times and these times that are familiar to Jewish people and have been for 2000 years, for more than that. But for 2000 years, we've been marking this time in a ritual way on the calendar. And, you know, for the longest time, I thought that it was about getting in touch with sadness, but actually maybe it's about getting in touch with imagination. So on the 17th day of Tammuz in the year 70, literally, historically speaking, what we are remembering on this day is the Romans breaching the walls of Jerusalem. So Jerusalem, 
walled city, as many were in ancient times to keep out invaders. And um, the Romans, who were taking over the ancient Near East and Mediterranean at that time, very much wanted this land and the pesky Jewish people who insisted on sovereignty of their own space um, were not complying and were actually holding the Romans at bay. And it was on the 17th of Tammuz that they breached the walls and came into Jerusalem and started slaughtering people, which was, you know, the beginning of the sort of last stand and the three weeks until Tisha B'Av. Tisha B'Av, of course, marks the destruction of the temple. So if the 17th of Tammuz is about getting into the walls of Jerusalem, Tisha B'Av is about the destruction of the Jewish center of spiritual and religious and communal and social and political life. That was the temple. And so we mark that day also with fasting, reading the Book of Lamentations and remembering all of the losses that the Jewish people over 2000 years has suffered. So like I said, dark time on the calendar we're in. But more expansively, and even metaphorically, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem represents what B'nai Lappi, what Rabbi B'nai Lappi would call a crash. By the way, I got to interview Rabbi Lappi this week on uh, Contact Chai, our podcast, and you should all listen to it when it comes out. It's sort of a uh, ramp up to Tisha B'Av. A lot of the ideas I'm going to be sharing with you tonight come from our conversation, so thank you, B'nai. Um, a crash is the crumbling and utter breakdown of a system of thought or culture or belief, a family, a relationship that had once been central to you and that has completely broken down. So the 17th of Tammuz is the moment when you realize that a crash is in process and that you may need to rethink everything. <clears throat> The way that Jewish history often talks about the destruction of the temple is that it was that moment that changed everything in which we built a new Judaism on the foundation of the rubble of the temple. But that's actually false. It's sort of like saying the civil rights movement began with Rosa Parks choosing to sit at the front of the bus and not getting out of her seat as if there hadn't been groundwork being laid by thousands of people over years, tirelessly preparing for the moment when the movement already very much in process could go from the fringes to the center. And so if in the year 70 CE, you were to take the camera off the smoldering wreckage of the temple and to move a few dozen miles north and west of Jerusalem, you'd see a city called Yavne, in which things had already changed, in which they were already creating a new Judaism. In Yavne, there was a group of, again, thank you Rabbi Benet for the language here, a group of radical, fringy, queer guys called rabbis, which was not a term that anybody used then to describe anybody important, you know? Rabbis weren't a thing back then. Um, if you were important, you were a priest in the temple or a politician or a wealthy landowner. So Yohanan ben Zakkai, who was a leader and connected, friendly with the Roman leadership, he could see the writing on the wall. He knew what was going on. He knew that the, the temple and the Jewish structure of power and authority was crumbling. And so he asked to be ferried out of the walled city of Jerusalem and his students carried him out in a coffin in the night so he could set up a yeshiva in Yavne. And so as Jerusalem burned and some of his former colleagues fought to save the old way, he and a group of disciples developed the rituals and practices and texts that would help them and everybody else mourn the loss of the temple and the old way of life and move forward. They developed Judaism's brilliant mourning practices and Shabbat practices and holidays and kashrut and how to do business ethically and how to celebrate holidays and, you know, um, everything. Everything that we do as modern Jews, they came up with. Um, 
we practice a Judaism called rabbinic Judaism developed by rabbis. We don't practice temple Judaism. And so these folks, these guys in this yeshiva, these you know fringy queer radical bunch, they along with dozens or maybe even hundreds of other communities of Jews on the fringes for whom the temple had stopped working and stopped being relevant long ago, they were the ones positioned to take up leadership after the crash and to reinvent Judaism. And they did, in fact, reinvent Judaism. And their genius was calling it Judaism and not, you know, calling it some other religion, maintaining a sense of continuity between the old and the new and actually asserting with, with I think, utter conviction that the values that animated Judaism 1.0 were still alive in Judaism 2.0. They just needed to be rebooted it looked nothing like Temple Judaism. Temple Judaism was based on animal sacrifice, avodah. And these guys said, you know what? The world rests on three things. Torah, wisdom, study, learning. Avodah, not animal sacrifice. Prayer, worship, and gimilut chasadim, acts of loving kindness and service. And they created the religion that we continue to practice today in which these are the main features. And I'm sure, of course, when they heard of the defeat of their friends and the loss of Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel, these rabbis must have been devastated and probably really confused. Like, what are we to do now? And they channeled that confusion into visionary creativity and into imagining a radically different future than the past from which they had come and a future that importantly for them didn't place all of their security and hope in one location and that allowed their people to become a diaspora people who faced Jerusalem to pray three times a day, but who could do it from anywhere in the world. And we became a people who place our security not in grand buildings and structures, but in books and ideas and morality and wisdom and spiritual practices that we can teach and model to our friends and family and share and pass around anywhere in the world, whether or not there is a temple nearby. Some of the most inspiring stories of Jewish families in America are, you know, the folks who, you know, drove for two and three hours to get to a temple once a year for the high holidays, but maintain their Jewish lives and identities in the absence of any formal structures of worship but with local day-to-day, -day, Shabbat to Shabbat, holiday to holiday practices that could be done anywhere. This is what made Judaism possible. You know, and it's funny, even thinking about the guys 2,000 years ago could have probably not pictured our lives now or many of the dimensions of our lives now, but in this moment, in quarantine, without the ability to inhabit buildings to hold us, we are relying on the spiritual structures that they created out of their profound awareness that the structures of their time also weren't working and needed fixing. And I think about the doubt that many of them must have brought to that moment, you know, thinking to themselves, this vision of Judaism is unrealistic. This isn't how Judaism is practiced. This isn't what Judaism is. It will never work. It is too different from what we had before. Nobody will actually do it. It won't work. And they had no guarantee that you or I would be here now, continuing to do all of the things that they set in motion, you know, all those many years ago. And I think that's just, I don't know, so relatable. This whole question of should, should I be optimistic or pessimistic, like embrace a new and, and even outlandish idea because things are broken now and they need fixing, but I don't know what to do. And so there are some ideas that are being put forward that, man, they seem radical, but, but maybe it just might work, just, just radical enough that it just might work. And on the other side, we need to do what's pragmatic. We need to approach change slowly and incrementally and only do what's possible to do slowly, 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 because too much all at once will break the system all over again. You know, and thinking like, oh, my heart and soul wants to believe that change is really possible. And my brain says it won't work, so don't bother doing anything. I think that's the trap that many of us fall into. 
what's the point? Or let's just tweak and tinker with the status quo. And our ancestors were brave enough to make this full paradigm shift and commit to it and to choose to embody a practice and a vision for themselves and their family and their future descendants. And they changed the world. And they changed the freaking world. And here we are. We are in a profound moment of crash. We all feel and sense that we are in a profound moment of crash. You know, we think that we are in charge of our bodies and our health. Coronavirus crash. We think that local and state and federal government and the police are designed and here to keep us safe and to protect us, all of us. Crash. For those of us who have been holding out the increasingly unlikely hope for a two-state solution, for Jews and Palestinians to have self-determination as Israel inches toward annexation against the better judgment of military and security advisors and against the moral judgment of nearly the entire international community, including many of Israel's beloved friends, this moment feels like a crash. If there are other crashes you're experiencing and wrestling with, I know it's vulnerable sometimes to share like what's crashing for you because it means that you place your faith in something that isn't working or that isn't working the way that you hoped that it would. But I, I invite you to share what's crashing for you right now. And I wonder how much of these things, how many of these things are shared and what we might learn from one another about what we're praying for and what we're deeply pained by in the world right now. I think about Yohanan ben Zakkai and his disciples. The destruction of Jerusalem actually wasn't a crash for them. I mean, it was in a sense, but they knew what was happening long before it happened and they were willing to acknowledge it and to take action before it was popular. That's what made them special. That's what made them different. They were willing to do something radical before it was popular. And I think right now, there are lots of people for whom this moment is not a crash. Namely, black and indigenous people, people of color, queer people, immigrants, Israeli and Palestinian activists, healthcare workers, people suffering from lack of good or any health care, people with disabilities, people for whom the system has not been working for a long time, for whom this moment is not a great awakening, but is just making what they already knew more visible and a public affirmation of what they've been talking about for years. And the question is now, are we going to listen and be changed by what we hear, by what we know? In order to get through this and to live into a different future, I think we have to be prepared to let go of aspects of the present that we may have grown very comfortable with. We may even have to be prepared to sacrifice ideas or beliefs that have inspired us right up to this moment. And yet we realize in our heart of hearts are not working or are in desperate need of recreation. And this will be hard and we will need each other's support and not each other's judgment in those moments. In this week's Parsha, we see this incredible story, very unique story in the Torah, of five daughters of a guy named Slofachad, who I just call Ted for short. And the daughters are named, again, an unusual thing in the Torah, Machla, Noah, Chogla, Milka, and Tirza. And they come forward to Moses and they say to him, you know, Moses, the laws of inheritance don't include women, and that's not fair. And Moses takes the case to God. And God says to Moses, there I saw what Moses' eye did not see. And God changes the inheritance law to include women. There I saw what Moses' eye didn't see. Moses, the greatest prophet, still had blinders on. 
still you could say, was working within a system of male privilege in which he could not see who was missing, who was disenfranchised. So think of every social movement that has ever enfranchised any group of people in this country, anywhere. You know, think of ending slavery in America, getting women the vote, protecting women's rights to our bodies, affirming same-sex marriage. All of these require the people who are the ones directly affected, who see what Moses and the other people in charge can't see. Like the daughters of Tzlovachad stating your case and being taken seriously, being listened to by the people already enjoying those privileges, not being told you want too much too quickly or what you want isn't a big deal. And together, the daughters of Tzlofechad and everybody else who already had an inheritance envisioning and working toward and marching toward and voting for a different future together. Because the truth is when one group rises, everybody rises, everybody rises. And the fear that comes along with that is the fear that we need to work with, talk through, breathe through. But this is, this is the future that we have the opportunity to be born into, to birth. And so this is the work of the three weeks. And it's why for the first time I'm experiencing these three weeks, not as sad, but rather as an opening, as a cause for optimism, because the walls have been breached. The crash is happening. It's in process. The question is how much space we can clear within ourselves and within public space to hear the voices of the people who have been diligently and with vision for years, working at the margins, preparing what's coming next. How can we put those voices into the center and learn from them and build a society that arises beautifully and inclusively from the one that is breaking down? So I'm feeling optimistic, which is a strange way to feel during these three weeks and during this hot quarantine summer. Yes, 2020 sucks. Maybe it sucks just enough to get us to do something now to be part of history. Shabbat shalom.